who have been studying this issue for quite some time. On February the 24th and March the 3rd, we are sponsoring a two-part series under our new priority of promoting civil discourse and politics called Beyond Polarization, Building Community Capacity for the Conversations Our Democracy Needs. This will be led by um, Dr. Martine Carcassen of CSU Center for Public Deliberation. And then on March the 2nd, there will be a town hall webinar focusing on HR1, the For the People's Act, featuring speakers from LWV US and Colorado's congressional delegation. All of these events can be accessed through our website, lwvcolorado.org. Introducing tonight's speaker, speakers is our legislative liaison, Andrea Wilkins. Andrea serves as the chair of our legislative action committee and she is the league's chief lobbyist. Andrea. Thank you, Karen. I appreciate the introduction and I wanna thank everyone for joining us this evening uh, for this webinar on alternative voting methods. Um, as Karen mentioned, my name is Andrea Williams and I'm the legislative liaison with the League of Women Voters of Colorado. Um, alternative voting methods are an issue that is of great interest and importance to the league. Um, as many of you are aware, the on voting methods that support authorizing and implementing alternative voting that allow people to express their preferences more effectively. The league supports gaining on the ground experience with alternative voting methods in order to ascertain whether a voting method results in an outcome that matches the voters' preferences as recorded on their ballots. Uh, we support voting methods that improve the election experience, that encourage honest rather than tactical voting, and that consider the ease of implementation. We're pleased that alternative voting methods are actively being considered by the General, uh, General Assembly this session. Um, they just reconvened today after um, about a five week um, temporary adjournment due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, we're anxiously awaiting um, additional activity in this area and watching out for some legislation that's upcoming. Um, and we're very fortunate to um, be joined tonight by, by Representative Chris who is one of the prime sponsors of legislation that will provide for the use of ranked choice voting in municipal elections. Uh, Representative Kennedy rep, uh, represents House District 23, which is within the city of Lakewood. And he's a member of the State Veterans and Military Affairs Committee, the Health and Insurance Committee, and the Legislative Council. Um, I believe Representative Kennedy is logging on, although I'm pleased to see many of you here and I can't quite spot him in the crowd. I'm here. Um, perfect, perfect. All right, Representative Kennedy, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. You are very welcome. Sorry, it took me a couple minutes to get there. You guys had the passcode enabled, so it took me a minute to track that down. Um, First of all, I will start with this. The bill got introduced today and it is House Bill 1071. So I'll go ahead and paste the link in the chat so that any of you that want to take a look at it can. Um, so, you know, I'm going to start with kind of how I came by this. Uh, I get involved in a lot of city council and school board elections in, in my off years. I have always felt that the local government representation is incredibly important. And yet one of the things I've seen up close and personal is how frequently we have three or more candidates running for a city council seat where the winner doesn't need to get a majority vote of the people of the district. We have vote splitting issues. We have strategic voting issues. We have a lot of consternation about the idea that one candidate or more may be a spoiler rather than just allowing the candidates to get out there and put themselves forward and see who votes for them. And it's, it's been a real challenge in, in my uh, municipality in Lakewood. And, and so it's something that I've been concerned about for a long time. Uh, I got plugged into this group that was advocating for ranked choice voting. I've spoken with many of the folks from the league several times about this and really appreciate the advocacy. And, you know, there's kind of a, a broad spectrum of um, different things that could be put into a ranked choice voting proposal. I think that we 
felt, uh, I should say I, I, I mostly felt that I needed to kind of narrow the scope for a few reasons to make sure we were, we were going to be successful because this is still pretty unfamiliar to a lot of folks. When I talk to people about ranked choice voting, um, there are a lot of folks that just have all kinds of concerns about, well, how is it going to play out in this scenario and how is it going to play out in this scenario where, where they're really worried about it. And so starting small, starting with something that is optional for cities but actually makes their current authority more usable in that we would be requiring the county clerks and the secretary of state to empower them and help build these systems for them uh, felt like the right move for us. Uh, I know there's a lot of passion about exploring approval voting as well, as well as the multi-winner version of, of ranked choice voting, single transferable vote. Um, these are things that I'm open to, but also felt like they needed to not be in this, this first bill because what I want to do is make sure we at least get something out there where it becomes a meaningful opportunity for cities to start using ranked choice voting in their elections without the current burden of having to run the election themselves as opposed to partnering with the counties. And I'm excited about the bill. Um, the legislation itself, as you will see, is mostly just language directing the Secretary of State's office to certify software and procedures. So the, the language is pretty straightforward in that way, but we've done a lot of work on that with the Secretary of State's office, with some of our county clerks who are eager to help, and the league has given really good feedback on a couple different versions of the draft. So I'm grateful for everything you guys have uh, contributed to the bill. It's going to have a million dollar fiscal note. That's going to be a challenging issue. Um, development of the new risk limiting audit protocol is about $550,000 for the Secretary of State's office to do that. And we can't do the bill without that. This has to be an auditable election so that we can demonstrate confidence and show people that it makes sense. The good news is that money comes from the Secretary of State's cash fund rather than coming out of the general fund. So it's not competing with K-12 or some of our other priorities out here. And I think we're gonna be able to get the funding for it without too big of a problem, but there are gonna be some who are a little nervous about spending a million dollars on something that's kind of an unknown. Um, I kind of jumped all over the place. I didn't exactly have a, a planned outline of what to talk about today. So I think with, with that, I will just pause and, and we can take questions and go wherever you guys wanna go with this. And I would encourage people just to um, unmute themselves and chime in. I know this is um, a, an issue that's really of interest to many of our members. So please feel free to chime in with a question directly. Um, you can also add it in the chat. I'll ask a question. This is Celeste from Boulder County. Um, so one of the problems is the cost. And, um, and then you want to keep it narrow for political reasons. Um, but maybe if you broadened it to include the multi-winner version, it would not increase the cost it would not include a risk limiting audit for the multi-winner version because that's not, that's impossible. Um, and you might get more advocates on board. <laughs> Making my regular plug here, Rep Kennedy. I, I appreciate that, Celeste. I actually do think it would add cost um, because they'd have to develop some sort of audit protocol unless we just said you don't audit the elections. So there is an audit protocol right now in rule 26 of the Secretary of State rules. That's right. You flagged that for me once before, and I was supposed to go dig into that. I will try to remember this time to do that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm open to that. I think that the demonstrating that that this is is um, auditable is important. But um, I'm open to being wrong, and the title is broad enough that we could we could go there if we get everyone on board. But I just want to make sure that we we really check the traps on that. Um, Jan posted a question. Please give a brief overview on the method. Uh, so the, the method we're using for ranked choice voting in a single winner race, also known as instant runoff, is as simple as it sounds. You have five candidates in a race. You, you rank them in order of your preference, one, two, three, four, five. If no one gets 50% on the first ballot, 
they take the person in the number five slot and reallocate their votes to their second choices. If no one still has 50%, then they drop off person number four and reallocate their second choices until someone gets to 50% of the vote. And so it's actually the simplicity of that that's one of the things I really appreciate is, you know, people ask me all the time, okay, how are, how are the parties going to game the system? How are candidates going to game the system? And everything I've read on this points to this being the least gameable of the voting methods. There are arguments that approval voting is gameable, that people might make strategic choices. But in this one, it's, you know, there's really no disincentive to filling in your second, third, fourth, or fifth choice, because your first choice is still the most important one. And then after that, it's, it's your second choice. So this is <clears throat> Peggy from Boulder County also. Uh, and I'm just wondering what the Secretary of State feels like um, if she feels she has the million dollars to spare out of her cash fund. Uh, Secretary Griswold has been very helpful. She has not taken a formal position on the bill yet, but she has had some encouraging conversations with me and she has certainly authorized her staff to pursue this with me and, and has given them the green light to work hard on helping develop these protocols with me. Um, the funding question is, it's kind of up in the air because they have to assess the cumulative impact of every policy that draws on that same cash fund. And the consequence, if we, if we appropriate more money than they have in the fund, the consequence is they turn around the next year and increase fees. And so as you guys may know, the entire elections division at the Secretary of State's office is funded by business licensing fees because they also have a business licensing function. There was actually a Supreme Court case about that a couple of years ago, determining whether that was actually legal. Uh, fortunately, sanity prevailed and they did find that that was a legal use of those funds. But if we spend too much between this bill and some other bills that draw on that cash fund, it might push for an increase in business licensing fees in the next year. So that's the, that's the consequence that we'll have to weigh. Can you tell us a little bit about the costs for local or county municipal municipalities? Yeah, absolutely. The question was about uh, the question was about the cost to local governments. As the bill is currently structured, we've minimized the cost to local governments. We haven't completely eliminated it, but because we have taken on so much of the cost at the state level, it's going to really limit what the locals have to spend. So the state right now will be. Um, negotiating a statewide agreement with the software company that will make that software then available for free to the counties. Similarly, with all the protocols and processes they use, they'll be making that available. And so for the counties, I think the biggest potential cost is that a ranked choice voting election takes up more space on the ballot than others. And so if the addition of ranked choice voting elections on the ballot pushes the ballot to two sheets of paper, that's a major cost increase for the counties, which they would then be authorized to pass along to the cities. There are probably some other costs that will just involve training. I don't think there should be additional staff required to do this, but there will be some training. There will be some informational resources put up on websites. And we are encouraging but not mandating the cities and the counties to work together on a voter education plan. So that's kind of an optional expense, but I'm hoping they decide to invest some money in helping people understand how a ranked choice voting election works, at least for the first go round. Because after that first time, I think people are gonna have a pretty clear sense of how it works. A hand by early yeah start. yeah hi uh i was so happy to see i just saw the email like five minutes before so thank you and here i am um i i know enough about ranked choice voting i'm not an expert but um i see it as 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 a way of injecting democracy into our two-party system i don't know if you see it that way chris i and my question is i've heard that both parties don't like ranked choice voting because it takes power away from the parties and puts it more into the power of the people. So are, how are you expecting this to go with the Republicans and Democrats? Do you think this will get passed? So 
I would characterize the party's objections to ranked choice voting a little bit differently. I think that it's fear of the unknown. I think the parties feel like they have a handle on how elections play out and what they mean and kind of the impact of third party candidates. And there is a fear of, of what would happen in a general election if, if ranked choice voting were the case. I don't think any of them are all that nervous about using it in primary elections or the presidential primary. That said, there is a nervousness about a slippery slope. And so I think that the parties, I, I have not yet gotten an official word from the state Republican party, although I am working on building some of those connections. The state Democratic party isn't too concerned with the current bill because it's limited to municipal nonpartisan races. Um, we did discuss whether this ranked choice voting bill should go bigger than that in the first year, but we, we felt like we need to demonstrate that it makes sense and start getting people a little more comfortable with it before we scale it up to any statewide races or, or state primaries. So right now, not, not significant party objections to it. If we went bigger, we'd probably have some bigger concerns from them. And are you a big advocate of this? And, and do you want to see a bigger vision of this? Or are you just putting your toe into it yourself? Like, I, what, what, what's, what's your vision? Do you see this as a solution to, to some of our democracy problems or not? Yeah, I mean, yes, I do think that this makes sense across the board. I, I'm, not, I'm not one of those people who's afraid of the consequences of this. I think this is, it just is a, is a, pro, is a process that makes a lot of sense. So I would like to see ranked choice view, voting used in, in all elections. Um, but I, I also think that there's a more acute problem in the nonpartisan races. I mean, from my perspective, when it only takes 25 signatures to get on the ballot, you, you have this risk of, of so many candidates splitting up the vote. For traditional elections where you would have to go through a nomination or a, a higher petition threshold, it's not as big of an issue. So. I, while I do support ranked choice voting more broadly, I'm not sure whether I'm necessarily coming back next year with a bigger bill. I think I want to see this play out. I want to build some support for it. I want people to start recognizing what this looks like in practice and developing their own comfort for it. And I think there will come a time where we go bigger. But for the time being, I'm just focused on the problem right in front of us. Thank you for getting the ball rolling. I think that's great. And I saw, I want to last question. I saw Steve Fenberg was uh, this, uh, the Senate sponsor. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the sponsors? Are you all equally excited or you just got people's names on there? I'm just kind of curious how, how strong Steve is behind this, obviously being the leader in leadership. <laughs> Steve's on board. I mean, for, for him, this, he saw this play out in Boulder. He saw that the city of Boulder passed this ballot measure and he knows that we have to fix it. So he's on board. I'm not sure. I, I can't speak for him and his feelings about going bigger than municipal races. But in terms of solving the municipal problem, he's 100 percent on board. And Jenny Arndt is the same way. She's very supportive of, of the bill. Thank you. Um, there's a question in the chat uh, what the implementation date is. It looks like this was just a direct question to me. The idea is have this all up and running by November 2023. So there are some incremental deadlines in the bill, when rules must be promulgated, when software must be certified, um, when a new risk limiting audit protocol must be in place, all designed such that the clerks at the beginning of 2023 can start planning for their November 2023 election. Linda? Uh, yeah, I have a question about um, one of the details. So, Will the bill require all municipalities to participate or is it sort of an opt-in? It's optional. It's optional for the cities. It's What's not optional is that if a city does opt-in, the counties have to help them. <laughs> so we're not, we're, not, we're not giving the counties a veto over the cities in this, but it's totally optional for a city to decide whether they want to do it. Thanks. This is Andrea Wilkins. I'll chime in with a question. Um, Representative Kennedy, you might be aware that um, the league, I think like many organizations right now, many people right now, is really concerned about um, 
the lack of civility in our public discourse. And um, that's something that we're really trying to focus on and think through what we can do as an organization to help improve um, civility in our public conversations. Can you speak a little bit to the theories that surround ranked choice voting um, and the impact that it's believed they have on civility? Yeah. I have to admit, I haven't taken a deep dive into this research, but I am familiar with at least one argument, which is that, you know, typical races, you go for blood, you know, you go, you, you say positive things about yourself, but you also say negative things about the other candidates in the race. And there's a theory out there that with ranked choice voting elections, you need to cultivate some second choice votes from people. You can't just spend all your time attacking the other candidates. So it might incentivize you to run a more positive campaign so that you, so that no one is going to say, well, gosh, I'm not going to make this person my second choice vote. Uh, there's a question in the chat about how does ranked choice voting compare with the star method? Unfortunately, I don't have the I don't know what the star method is, I'm afraid. Um, I have someone else posted the question of have I looked at approval voting I have there there's actually a pretty robust debate about approval voting versus ranked choice voting um, I've spoken with some national voting experts I guess there are organizations supporting both at the national level but uh, fair vote has a website that I've been looking at that has some pretty good arguments on the pros and cons I think that the, the reason that I have kind of gravitated towards ranked choice voting over approval voting is um, one, I think it's really straightforward. I think it's less likely to be gamed. And while it may not be as simple to administer by the, the you know, the staff and, and, and that the ballot ends up being longer and whatnot, I think it's actually the most fair and straightforward way to do it. Linda? Yeah, I have, a, I have another question. Um, and thank you so much for running this bill. I really appreciate it. Um, are you finding it um, easy or difficult to explain to your colleagues in the legislature? Are people sort of grasping it or is it pretty complex? You know, it's, it's not too complex. I, I haven't had all that many conversations with my colleagues yet. The work to date has mostly been talking with county clerks and you know other other stakeholders, but now that we're back in session is when I really am going to begin the work of talking to my colleagues about it. Um, a fair number of people understand it. A fair number have never heard of it before and don't really know what it's all about. But fortunately, um, the other Linda on this call, Linda Templin's group, put together a really great kind of fact sheet that demonstrates what the process looks like that we have put into a document that we'll be distributing to legislators. And I think when they see it on paper, it's just, I think it's gonna be super easy for them to understand. What I will say is hard. The county clerks are not really on board with this. Now the Boulder County clerk is, Molly Fitzpatrick knows that this is an urgent issue we need to solve because of what happened in Boulder. My own county clerk, George Stern is on board and he's um, pretty supportive of what we're trying to do. And I've had good conversations with uh, Denver clerk, Paul Lopez as well. But I will tell you that I've spoken with the El Paso County clerk and I've spoken with the executive director of the clerks association and their perspective is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So I don't know whether they're gonna be neutral or opposed to the bill, but I think there's a reasonable probability they're gonna oppose it. So if there's one thing that this group can take away, I know that there's some kind of limit limits on how the league chooses to use your, your power, but um, communicating with your county clerks and letting them know that this is something we want is, is something that might be really helpful to the success of the bill. Um, there's a question about the Pueblo clerk. I have not yet spoken with a Pueblo clerk, um, but I can make sure that's on my to-do list. And yes, um, yeah, Linda, said, Linda Templin said she could send the fact sheet which her organization put together. There's a there's a modified version. I, you know, I do my own kind of legislative fact sheet that's kind of in my own voice, but it sampled heavily on what Linda's organization put together. 
Um, I have not yet spoken with the Larimer clerk either, although I believe my colleague, Representative Jenny Arndt, is going to be making that outreach. Um, hi, Charlie here again. Uh, I, I, I know I'm on some emails of some of the national groups that are really behind this as a national topic, like Represent Us and, and, and the other one that you just mentioned. Um, are you getting any, do you, do you envision getting any support from them and helping, uh, I, don't, I don't know, to get a bill like this passed, if there's funds needed or just influence, or I don't know what you need, but are you looking for national help on, the, on this? <laughs> so there's two national groups that I've been in touch with. One of them is a ranked choice voting resource center out of DC, and they've provided kind of technical guidance and knowledge resources, which have been helpful. The other is Unite America, um, and they, um, they're, they're currently employing former Speaker of the House, Terrence Carroll, who has been really helpful, and they, they do have some resources that they're bringing to bear to help support the bill. Um, I'm interestingly beginning to find some bipartisan support on this. I had a good meeting with Colorado Concern last week, who is a statewide business organization who they normally wouldn't wade into election issues, but they are, are familiar with some of the issues that I've seen in municipal elections and, and might be interested in helping us. So I'm, I'm eager to hear back from them once they've taken it back to their board. I see we have a question in the chat about the, um, the anticipated schedule for the bill. Um, Representative Kennedy, do you have a sense of when it is coming up for its first committee hearing? Yeah, so good news. I, uh, it got assigned to the State Affairs Committee, and I'm the chair of that committee, so I get to decide. Um, I, I don't know yet. I, need, I got 22 different bills assigned to my committee today, and I need to go over them all and start kind of gaming out the next few weeks of when I want to do what. So I guess my gut would be probably not next week, but probably the week after. But I reserve the right to change my mind about that as I balance all the other things. Looks like we have one more question, maybe uh, Jacob Farmer. Yeah, hi, my name is Katie Farmer. Um, so it seems to me that this would be like a, a nice step in the direction of you know, having our votes reflect the people's voices. Um, and as I was kind of looking at one version of the bill, something that caught my eye was it referred to a lot of these electronic um, machines or whatever. Um, I'm not very familiar with Colorado as a whole um, in terms of how people physically vote. And that um, piqued my interest because I had heard that it's nice to have an actual paper ballot trail in terms of just the safety of our elections. Um, can you speak to just your opinion on that and also what those, like how many, um, I, I just don't understand how most people vote in Colorado, if yeah. that is a concern at all to you or to the Secretary of State. Um, and maybe this is not the right place to be concerned about this. Maybe the bill should just be addressing this one issue, but it, it was something that, that I thought of when I was reading it. Yeah, I appreciate that question, Katie. The, the good news is Colorado is 100% on paper ballots. Either you get a ballot in the mail that you fill out and send back in, or if you do vote on one of the machines, that have the, you know, that are accessible equipment, they print a paper record for you. So everything has paper backup in Colorado. We, we made a major overhaul of our system in 2013 and it's been working great. So it's very accountable, it's all audited. I think that, you know, people do bring up concerns but I think we have great answers to all of these concerns. So with that, I gotta run. Um, I really appreciate you guys, uh, inviting me to speak to this group tonight. Thank you so much. And, and uh, feel free, I'll post my email address in the chat too. So you guys can send me any additional questions you might have. 
thank you for joining us tonight, Representative Kennedy. We really appreciate the information and you taking the time to talk with us. Yeah, my pleasure. Take care. Before we turn to our next speaker, um, I do see um, another question in the chat um, that's asking about the league support for this bill. Um, it, as probably most people know, um, you know, LAC, uh, the Legislative Action Committee, will be um, reviewing the legislation and um, voting to, um, you know, follow the bill, take a position on it that will guide um, our advocacy efforts. Um, the LAC has not had our first meeting yet. That'll be taking place this Friday. Um, and this bill is definitely one that we have been looking out for. Um, although, um, you know, we have not had a meeting and officially voted to take a position yet, we are supportive of the concept and, um, you know, believe that it, it falls in line with our positions. Um, so we'll be discussing that further at uh, the LAC meeting on Friday. Um, and with that, I would like to shift now um, to our next speaker, who is Marcus Ogren, um, who is a member of the voting methods team with the League of Women Voters of Boulder County. Marcus will be talking to us about alternative voting methods a little more broadly and um, some of LWVBC's work in this area. So with that, I will hand it over to Marcus. Okay, thank you. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so yeah, <coughs> excuse me. So I want to talk about voting methods more broadly. That means um, other single vote winner voting methods, not just RCV and plurality. The problem solved by these voting methods and finally proportional representation and how we can move in that direction. So first other voting method I want to talk about is approval voting. Approval voting is really simple. It replaces the vote for one you see on your ballots nowadays with vote for all the candidates you approve of. Basically, you give every candidate a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Whoever has the most thumbs up wins. Approval voting is used in Fargo and St. Louis, and it's probably familiar to most of you, albeit not by that may name, from things like doodle polls. One particularly nice thing about approval voting is it's basically free to implement. There's no need for new machines, new software, or larger ballots, etc. Another voting method is called square voting. It's kind of like approval voting in that every candidate is rated individually, not just in reference to the other candidates, and you can give multiple candidates the same square. How it works is that now square voting works is that every candidate receives a numerical square and whichever candidate has the highest total square wins. Um, square voting is not used in governmental elections anyway, anywhere, but it should be familiar from things like Amazon product reviews and judging at some events in the Olympics. There is a catch to the added expressiveness you've got with approval vote with square voting in that it's strategically optimal for our voters to give every candidate either the minimum square or the maximum square. This is not a deal breaker by any means, since when everybody does this, it just functions like approval voting, which is still good. But it would be nice if we could encourage voters to use these intermediate squares. One way we can accomplish this is by using a variation of square voting called star voting. So that's right for square, then automatic runoff. Star voting uses the same ballots as vanilla square voting. The difference is that instead of the highest squaring candidate winning outright, the two highest squaring candidates go to an automatic runoff, which uses the same ballots that have already been cast. For the runoff, you see which of the two finalists is rated higher on more ballots. So this ballot here has Andrew with a higher rating than Edith, so Andrew gets this vote. Whichever candidate has more votes in that runoff is the winner. Star voting encourages the use of these intermediate, intermediate ratings by um, the fact that you kind of have to use them in order to ensure that you get more of a voice in the runoff. After all, if the 
the runoff was between two candidates, you had each rated a five, then um, well, your ballot would have mattered in getting to that runoff, but it wouldn't have any voice in that runoff. Okay, so what are the problems that these voting methods can solve? What can we solve by implementing better voting methods? There's the spoiler effect, which has been talked about some, and the two-party system. And if we go beyond some of these methods, we can also deal with the lack of minority representation and all kinds of regional inequities. First, the spoiler effect. The iconic example of this is Ralph Nader in the 2000 presidential election. Most of his supporters probably preferred Al Gore to George Bush. And if Ralph Nader had not been in the race and they had just voted for their favorite front runner instead, Gore most likely would have won. Every single one of these methods I've covered, as well as ranked choice voter, addresses the spoiler effect. They do it in different ways, though. With joint choice voting, it's really simple. Nader supporters list Gwer as their second choice. Nader gets eliminated. Their votes get transferred to Al Gwer. Under approval voting, the is supporters can just vote for both Nader and Gwer. And this is strategically optimal since the hypothetical downside of voting for um, both Nader and Gwer instead of just Nader is that maybe where would just barely beat Ralph Nader and Ralph Nader come in second. But in this particular case with Ralph Nader not being particularly viable, that wouldn't happen. So it's strategically optimal for them to both vote for the two of them. Square is quite similar to approval. Just replace vote for with give the maximum square to. And under star, what you have is that both Bush and Guerrero will reach the runoff since they're the two most popular candidates by far. And Al Guerrero will receive full support from every Nader ballot that has Guerrero ahead of Bush. When you deal with the two parties with the spoiler effect, this also allows you to greatly erode the two party system. And the reason for that is that the two-party system is basically the mechanism that we've invented within the context of plurality in order to prevent the spoiler effect from causing the other party to win. We, we coalesce behind two candidates so that our, our voices are maximized, that, so that we're not throwing away our votes. And when we don't have to worry about the spoiler effect like that, we can support third parties or um, smaller factions in the context of municipal elections. And this can give ultimately give us a lot more viable options. And the two party system stemming from avoiding the spoiler effect means that every single one of these voting methods can enable the growth of third parties. Okay. How might that work closer to in practice? Here's a poll um, for the 2016 presidential race that you that asks voters how they're voting using, using different voting methods. And I want to focus specifically on Gary Johnson and Jill Stein here. We see that um, with all of these other voting methods they receive more support than they do under plurality. Now, the difference between plurality and ranked choice voting might not seem all that big here, but remember, this is just the pre-election poll. It's not what actually happened. And in the official results, Gary Johnson got 3% and Jill Stein got 1%. And that's quite natural for the remainder of these voters. They didn't want to throw their votes away when it came down to it. And so, it's quite common for our third party candidates to have much less support in the actual results than they do in such pre election polls. You would not expect to see this under the other voting methods, since um, supporting one of them with any of these voting methods does not prevent you from supporting your favorite of Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. Okay, that's just a pre election poll. Let's look at an actual country. 
And for that, let's take a quick trip to Australia and look at their largest third party, the Australian Greens. Here's how they did in 2019. In both the Australian House of Representatives and their Senate, they got over 10% of first preferences that's um, being marked as one's first choice on a ranked choice voting ballot. How did this translate? And um, you'll note that 10% is dramatically higher than third parties tend to get in the United States. So um, I'd say it's safe to say that um, ranked choice voting is enabling them to see this much support. How is this translated into actual seats? In this election, they won one seat in the House of Representatives out of 151. On the other hand, they won six seats in the Australian Senate out of 40 that were up for grabs in that election. That's a huge difference. And the reason for it is that the House and Senate use different forms of ranked choice voting. In the House, it's all instant runoff voting, the single win or a winner take all version of our CV. And in the Senate, it's single transferable vote, which is the proportional multi winner form of ranked choice voting. I'll have more to say on how single transferable vote works in a bit, but first of all, let's talk a bit more about proportional representation in the abstract. The basic idea behind it is that the composition of a legislative body should resemble the electorate in whichever ways the electorate deems are important. This can be race, it can be religion, it can be partisan ideology, it can be geography, what have you. It's up to the electorate. Also, this should be able to change over time and different factions within the electorate should be able to care about different things. One note for proportional representation is that it absolutely requires multi-winner elections. Um, you cannot have proportional representation when you've got winner take all. You can have the multi-winner elections in two ways. You can have multi-member districts where instead of a single district electing one person to Congress, it elects maybe five people. Where you could just have all the seats get determined at once in a single huge at-large election. Both work. Why exactly do we want proportional representation? First of all, it ensures minority representation, the Australian Greens being a case in point. It also makes gerrymandering a lot less important. If you go with the option of an at-large election with proportional representation, well, you don't even have districts, so there's not even such a thing as gerrymandering. If you go for multi-member districts, gerrymandering still doesn't work too well. After all, if you're a gerrymander, if you're a gerrymanderer and you're looking to win your party in election by drawing district lines, what you try to do currently is pack as much of your the opposition as possible into a few districts that which they win by uh, overwhelming margins as close to 100% as you can get. Whereas in the other districts, you win say, them say 60, 40. If these are five member districts that use proportional representation, what would happen if you try this is that the other party ends up winning every single seat in the district that they're packed into, and they still win two out of five seats in the districts in which they're, they are the minority party. So um, gerrymandering basically falls flat. A more subtle way in which proportional representation reduces the importance of geography is that it kind of eliminates the concepts of swing districts and safe districts. Personally, I live in Boulder, which is really, really liberal. The Republicans not winning our, this, the, our seat in the state legislature, realistically speaking. However, if we were to use multi-member districts, um, well, it's pretty safe to say that the Democratic Party would win the majority of seats here. But how big of a majority that is, is could vary. 
So um, if we had proportional representation, my vote would have as much of an influence in determining the partisan control of our state legislator as somebody who lived in a district that was roughly 50-50 split between Democrats and Republicans. And not having, and having more votes matter really should also improve voter turnout in these safe districts. So to sum it up, proportional representation is just plain fair. Okay. There's a lot of different ways to achieve proportional representation using better voting methods, but I'm just going to talk about one single transferable vote. It's the multi-winner form of ranked choice voting, and it's what they use for the Australian Senate. So it has everything you're familiar with from instant runoff voting where single winner ranked choice voting. So you've got the same ring ballots and the candidate eliminations and transfers uh, votes from the elimination the candidates works basically the same. It does ensure proportional representation and it does that first with a chain a significant rules change namely um, if a candidate has enough votes and this is less than an outright majority, they're elected. The enough is determined by this quota here and I won't get into the de details but this is the smallest number that means that um, the, oh, that you can't have more candidates exceeding this quota than there are winners. Also, you have surplus votes in excess of the, of the quota getting transferred to the next highest choices on the, on, on the ballots which voted for the candidate which won with some room to spare, and that prevents votes from being wasted. Here's an example of an STV election that I concocted. This is set in a relatively left-leaning congressional district. And you've got several Democratic candidates, Republican candidates, and an independent and a Green. In round one, um, well, here you've got just the raw first preferences, the whoever everybody likes the most. And there's four winners for this election. So that means there's a 20% threshold for how many votes you need. From just the first round, Debbie and Rebecca both clear the 20% mark, so they are elected. And for round two, their surplus is transferred to some other candidates. Okay, this brings candidates up to higher vote totals, but none of them reach the 20% threshold. And therefore, the candidate with the fewest votes Grace is eliminated. Sorry, Grace. Okay. Her surplus, her votes go to um, her candidate, her voters' backup choices. And this is enough to put Desmond over the top. So he is elected, and his surplus, which isn't that big, is trans gets transferred. So here, there's three candidates that have been elected, and three others still in the race, but none of them have reached the 20% threshold. So finally, Ron is eliminated and his voters mainly prefer Indy over Dennis and that's enough to get Indy elected. So you have a mostly left-leaning district and it doesn't only elect Democrats, it elects two Democrats, one Republican and one Independent. All right, what exactly could single transferable vote and proportional representation look like within the context of the United States. Perhaps the most ambitious proposal here is the Fair Representation Act. It would elect the U.S. House from multi-member districts using SDB. These districts would have, would, would have somewhere from three to five seats, um, where just one or two for the smallest states. And small states just have a single at-large election, and the larger states are divided in, into these districts. For Colorado, since we've got th seven representatives, would have two districts, one with three seats, one with, five, one with four. If we pick up another seat from the census, would have instead one district with three seats and the other with five. 
Currently, Representative Nagus is the only co-sponsor of the Fair Representation Act from Colorado. So to sum it up, ring choice voting, approval, square and star are all effective means of addressing the spoiler effect and giving third parties a better opportunity to grow. Um, there are interesting differences between them, certainly, um, and I could probably talk about them from for hours, but um, they still have a lot in common because they all address plurality, the greatest flaws with plurality voting. However, in order to do more and give us proportional representation, deal with gerrymandering, and really ensuring third party representation instead of just saying, oh, third parties have a real chance now, we need for we need something like single transferable vote, and we need multi winner elections to have that. Okay. Um, I've also got a few slides I could give on the tactics associated with approval voting if people want that, or um, I don't know, whatever people want. Sure, Marcus, if you have a couple of more slides that you can share, we do have um, a few more minutes left and um, I, I'm sure that we probably have at least um, a couple of questions, um, but feel free to render the additional information if you'd like to share that. Okay, so the topic of strategy under approval voting came up in the questions, as well as the question of whether or not approval voting is gameable. So I want to talk about how strategy works under approval voting. Um, basically, it's correct for a voter to vote for every single candidate whose election they see as being better than the average outcome for the election. The average meaning um, consider all the candidates and their probabilities of winning and how much you like them and um, get an average out of those probabilities. and like and levels of liking. Okay, here's a few heuristics for how you vote. Um, first, it is always, always correct to vote for your favorite. And you nearly always want to vote for at least one, though not every single one of the front runners, front runners being candidates you think have a pretty good chance of winning. Um, the exception here is if you're more or less indifferent to the front runners which can, for example, happen if there is exactly one front runner. Um, and if a candidate's almost as good as your favorite of the front runners, you probably want to vote for them too. Um, there's differences, there's exceptions, for instance, if there's exactly two front runners, um, you probably want to vote for exactly one of them even still. And also, if you vote for a candidate, you should also vote for every single candidate you like more than them. Here's the aggregate effects of voter strategy. Um, first, as mentioned previously, you don't have the non-viable spoilers. Um, if a candidate can't win, it's always correct for that candidate's supporters to vote for somebody else in addition. And yeah, when you've got two viable candidates, it's correct to vote for exactly one of them. An interesting effect is the tendency to vote for beat hall winners, that is to say, candidates who would beat any other of the candidates head to head. Um, the not 100% rigorous argument goes that if there is a beat all winner who would lose, there is an outright majority of voters who would be best off voting for that beat all winner in addition to whoever they like more than them. And that therefore, if this majority is being effectively strategic, um, they will elect that be all winner. Um, now, one case in which this argument doesn't work so well is if the beat all winner is just weakly preferred so that voters say, okay, I'd rather roll the dice here and try to get my favorite guy in. And, um, 
also it requires some decent knowledge of other voters preferences for this argument to work out that great. Um, as for how approval compares to ranked choice voting with strategy, um, it, I can't really say that one is strictly superior to the other. I mean, there are significant differences. I can say that ranked choice voting is more strategically straightforward and that um, with approval voting, if there are, say, five different candidates, there are four honest ways to fill out your ballot. Namely, you can vote for just your favorite, your top two, your top three, or your top four. Um, and there is some strategy involved in selecting which of those honest ways in which you should cast your ballot. A nice thing about approval voting is that it's always optimal to vote for in one of these honest ways. In ranked choice voting, you can have the occasional scenario in which it's optimal to vote dishonestly, that is to say, um, vote for a candidate, one candidate over another, when you actually like the candidate you're ranking, you're ranking lower more than the candidate you're ranking higher, but those are pretty rare and difficult to foresee. And also with approval voting, the strategic element allows it to capture the intensity of voters' preferences. Um, Whereas with ranked choice voting, you don't really get any information as to how much voters like particular candidates, just um, how those candidates compare to the other candidates, which is higher. Okay. Questions if we still have, got, have time? We're getting close to the end of our time, but um, I know there's a lot of interest in this. So um, if there are a couple of questions for Marcus, uh, please let's open it up and um, just go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, feel free to ask directly. So my question would be, does any of this make people more likely to be doing the gamesmanship of, oh, this guy is more likely to win than that guy, and so I should vote for this one other than that one? And that's what I sort of hate about elections, is that people are gaming it all out in their heads. Um, yeah. Each of these voting methods would deal with that problem as you described it. I mean, with approval voting, you've got, oh, my favorite can't win, so I need to vote for somebody else in addition to them, but it's in addition to them, not instead of them. So yeah, there is some strategy, but it's a much kinder form of strategy, basically. It's not the, oh, I'm just going to throw my favorite under the bus because she can't possibly win. All right, well, it looks as if we are um, about out of time. Um, I know there's probably a lot more discussion on this, um, but um, as I mentioned, the, uh, the Legislative Action Committee will absolutely be following and um, uh, be involved in the uh, ranked choice voting bill that Representative Kennedy spoke to earlier. Um, we really appreciate the information that you've provided us with tonight, Marcus. This has been uh, very helpful to, um, you know, really broaden the understanding of the various voting methods. Um, and uh, we would just really appreciate you taking the time to be here and discuss this issue with us. And on behalf of the League of Women Voters, I would like to um, thank everyone for being here, for your interest and engagement in this important issue. And I would like to wish you all a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.